Isaiah was talking about the look for God in the whirlwind and God wasn't there. God wasn't in the whirlwind. A lot of times God isn't in those those miraculous places and those uh, the the big huge things, the big expressions, the shock and the awe. But it said God was in the still small voice and I think many times we as a church we want to look for the spectacular, always looking for God in the supernatural and the spectacular when uh, we need to sometimes back up and just look at him in the still small voice and uh, many claim that that still small voice is a reference to the word of God we just stick to the word of God and what God says and over in John chapter 6 I'm going to read a few verses from there tonight and if you remember the Lord had, uh, they'd, they'd fed the 5,000 I think in another account it said there was 5,000 men besides women and children and and uh, a lot of miracles being done and the crowd began following the, the Lord not because of his tender heart not because of his word but many of them were following just because of the miracles uh, there's a, a tendency for a lot of people to look toward the charismatic that's why the charismatic churches are running these big mega churches because people are always looking for the spectacular and uh, what was going on here after the Lord had, had performed this miracle of feeding the 5,000 plus women and children it says in verse 2 that a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased and, and I've got a note here that this group didn't follow the Lord because they realized that they were sinners and needed a savior but they followed him to see the miracles and they failed to recognize him as the Messiah that was spoken of by the prophets here. So you gotta, gotta be, be careful. Sometimes the, the Lord isn't in the whirlwind. He's in the still small voice of the Holy Spirit of God. And it says in verse three, Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. And here we see the Lord leaving the multitude. I'm in John six going to uh, read some passages through there we see the Lord leaving the multitude he's going into a mountain and he's sitting down with his circle his close-knit circle of disciples it says in the Passover a feast of the Jews was nigh now uh, in our context here this is the third Passover and Christ himself becomes the fourth Passover and it's through these Passovers I think that most of the uh, theologians date of the, the chronology here and the, the, the age of the Lord when the Lord was crucified 33 and a, a half years in there it says in verse 5 when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him he saith unto Philip whence shall we buy bread that these may eat now even though this crowd was following Jesus because of the miracles the Lord still saw their need and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude moved with compassion toward him. And here he's getting ready to feed him. I got ahead of myself here. Now, he was moved with compassion. And a lot of times we as Christians, we, we, we're not moved with compassion. That's why we don't have many soul winners in the church like we used to have because people have lost their burden for souls. But here we see the Lord he was moved for compassion for the, uh, uh, these folks. He wanted to fill a physical need, but more importantly, he was looking to fill a spiritual need. The goodness and compassion of the Lord here is not dependent on the folks he reaches out here. A lot of times we make the mistake, well, if, if they come to me and do this and do that, then I'll reach out in love and compassion. No, the, the Lord don't work that way. When the Lord saved me, I, there was nothing in me uh, that commended me to the Lord. I was a sinner, I was a mess, and the Lord reached out to me anyway. And it's good if you can maintain that attitude when you're dealing with people that you need to love them as the Lord loved you. And God taught me that lesson not too many years ago when, when some things went on with my life and dealings with people, and, and uh, I'd ask the Lord to teach me how to love as he loves and that's what, what the Lord asked that we learn to love people as he loved 
And man, that's a painful thing. I thought it was going to be something uh, very, very nice and warm, and it turned out being something very painful. When you love someone the way the Lord loved you, that means that you have to many times love the unlovable. You have to forgive the unforgivable. You have to, to reach out to someone who don't really, there's nothing to commend them to you that you should want to reach out to them. But you do it because the Lord reached out to you. Many times I'll tell people that, especially in our addictions program, people that I deal with, I'll tell them, if God can love me, then I can love you. And that's the attitude the Lord's looking for. He, he loved us, so we should be able to love others. He, he uses that analogy in forgiveness. The parable of the, the servant whom his master had forgiven all so much, and then he wouldn't forgive the little bit that someone owed him. And the Lord forgave me so much, it would be pretty it would be pretty low character for me to refuse to forgive somebody so little that offended me. We're always wanting to get offended by somebody. You need to get over it. You need to get over it. So many things in my life have been an offense to my Lord and Savior, offense to, to His holiness, to offense to uh, all that, that my Lord stands for in righteousness, and yet I've offended Him. But someone offends me, and what am I, I'm supposed to act like... I've been terribly wrong. I'm just thankful that I'm saved. God saved me. I'm going to over, I need to learn to overlook some things that, that people uh, throw my way. And where are we at in our text? God's goodness is wrapped up in himself. That's who he is. His goodness don't depend on how good you are. Well, sometimes we think that we're helping God out. By doing something, we're helping God out. He needs our help. And, and no, he's, all his goodness and all his righteousness is who he is. That's his very character. And it's all wrapped up within himself. In Titus 3, 5, the Bible says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. By the washing, regeneration, renewing the Holy Ghost. So here he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And here we get around to this uh, big miracle, and that's why they're all following. Everybody wants to see a miracle. And, and so here it appears that the Lord is testing Philip's faith, and the Lord, Lord often does that. He'll do that with believers, even as he tested Abraham's faith. He'll test your faith from time to time. He wants to see what choice you make. You can have a choice to... Uh, uh, handle it the godly way, the scriptural way, or you can handle it the natural way, the fleshy way, the worldly way. And sometimes God will put us through that. The Lord confronted Philip uh, with a problem here, and Philip sees this great multitude needing fed, and Philip then looks to his physical resources, and uh, sometimes God presents us with uh, problems, and instead of looking to him, we look to our circumstances and the resources. I mentioned this morning, we, we look to the problem rather than to the problem solver. David uh, said in Psalms 57 too, I use this passage a lot, said, I will cry unto God most high, unto God who performeth all things for me. We don't depend on him. We want to do so many things in our own strength, and we don't have to do that. God wants to be there for you. He is there for you, and he wants you to use. He gets glory whenever we yield to him and his power and allow him to fix something. Now, we can run about uh, constantly trying to fix problems without ever going to God, and that's usually when things get messed up. He gets glory whenever we yield to him and say, God, you fix this. God, you show me what to do. God, you show me which way to turn. God, you show me what I need to do here. So, uh, Lord testing Philip's faith, and uh, sometimes God presents us with problems. Instead of looking to him, we look to the physical. In verse 6 here it says, And this he said to prove him. All right, here we go. That's what I just talked about. 
He said that to, to Philip to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. Now we all have seen ourselves in positions uh, uh, like Philip. God presents a problem and we just give it up. It says, uh, no, I can't do that. That's impossible. We can't do that. It's impossible. Hey, our God is the God of the impossible. Is, is, is anything impossible for God? We forget that. We really do. In uh, Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul said, I can do all things, all things through Christ which strengthens me. And, and, and that's the whole, the, that's the center point, the focal point of your walk with God is to let your walk be his walk. Let him walk and talk through you. Let, let the actions that you, you perform, the, the thoughts that you think, and the, the way that you handle things be through the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit of God. You walk in the light as he is in the light. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You do that. You walk in the light of your Lord, and you let him, let, let him uh, be the purpose in your life to fulfill his will. Lord, how do you want me to handle this? Lord, what should I do here? And many times it's, Lord, forgive me for this thought and forgive me for that thought, Lord. And I go through a lot of that. Psalms 43 and verse 5, the psalmist said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. So Philip here has his eyes on the circumstances rather than on the God of the circumstances. And uh, uh, Matthew 19, 26, the Bible says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, if you can believe it, all things are possible to him that believeth. My, my, my. I remember uh, Laura Hounce, Jeff's sister, when her husband got cancer and it looked very dark. He had throat cancer and uh, it looked pretty rough. And she talked about that verse that all things are possible. Only believe, only believe, believe. And, and we, we know from, from this chapter way down. In this chapter where, where we saw the order, we believe and are sure. You know, you believe what comes first, the belief. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So there's a point in every Christian's life when whatever you, you hope to accomplish and whatever you will accomplish will be based upon your faith in God to perform that which you do not have the ability or the a way, see a way to perform it, God can do that, and he will do that. I've seen it over and over and over again. And if you're here today and you've been saved very long, you've seen that happen in your life with the, the God that loves you and gave himself for you. So Philip here has his eyes on the circumstances. And uh, Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able. See, God is able. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I've got written down here. I don't know where I got it. It said the, uh, the birds without barn or storehouses are fed. From them let us learn to trust for our bread. His saints, uh, what is fitting, shall ne'er be denied. So long as tis written, the Lord will provide. When Satan appears to stop up our path and fills us with fears, we triumph by faith. He, he cannot take from us, though of the, this he has tried, the heart-cheering promise, the Lord will provide. God will provide. Verse 7 here in our text, Philip answered him. And here we see the, the, the conversation back and forth with the Lord and Philip. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. See, a little doubt setting in, a little skepticism. What, what, what are we going to do with this 
small about. We can't do it. That's what he's saying. He, uh, Philip here just simply did the math and figured that there is no way to feed this group. And uh, Philip spoke the language of doubt and hopelessness. And one of supposed that after all the disciples had witnessed uh, of the Lord's uh, wonder-working power, isn't that in one of the songs, his wonder-working power, they had learned probably by this time that all fullness dwelt with the Lord. There's nothing that he couldn't provide. You'd think that they would have learned that. I wonder if I would have learned that. You know, I, I, were, I sometimes were critical of those disciples for doing this and doing that. What would one wonder? <laughs> These men were a lot holier than I, uh, I was. I can't imagine the Lord choosing me to be one of his disciples. So that being said, we fall into this trap many times of unbelief. Uh, despite the miracles that God has already done in our lives, we still find ourselves many times in a, a place of unbelief and, and some anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety now uh, worldwide with this pandemic. What is God doing here? What is God trying to show us? Oh, am I going to get it? Is this going to happen to me? The Lord says, be careful for nothing. Casting all your care upon him. You give him that anxiety. It don't tell you to be stupid about it. You be smart about it. But you give that anxiety to God. And let, let, let him work it out. Here in verse 8 and 9. says one of his disciples Andrew. Simon Peter's brother saith unto him. There is a lad here that has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So here we see, see that the doubt is, it kind of catches. It's catching. One shows a little doubt, and the other one chimes right in and shares that doubt also. And we found that out many times, all of us probably. Like Philip, Andrew seemed to think that there was just nothing could be done. Well, just tough. That's tough. I preached this morning on can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Sure he can. Philip said that every one of them may take a little. Well, we can, we can you know. It's going to take a lot for everyone to just take a little. And Andrew said, well, uh, uh, what are these among, among so many? I mean, what, what's going on here? It looked like a, a total waste of time, even this conversation. What are these among so many? And their, their calculations were made apart from the power of Jesus Christ. And we have a tendency to see our difficulties in a light separate and apart from our Lord. I think it's just our nature. And, and if we keep our eyes on him, be surprised how those difficulties seem to fade away. Job, and, and Job 5, 8, I forget who's speaking here. I think it's Eliphaz speaking to Job. And he said, I, Job, and he says, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Place, he says, bring forth your strong arguments. He says, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And that's talking about your sins. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white like snow. So the Lord, the Lord wants to hear from you. He wants you to step out. He wants to reason with the Lord over, the, over this thing. Perhaps... Remember those four outside the gate? Why did we sit here till we die? Perhaps it'll work out. Might not, but perhaps. Three Hebrew children, our God will deliver us. But if not, learning to step out on faith. Step out on the measure of faith God gives you. 
1 Corinthians 1, 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. The disciples should have known by now that little is much when God is in it. We haven't sang that song in a while, have we? Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Little is much. We see that from that story here. God will often make up the difference when we don't have the resources, we don't have the talent, we don't have the ability. I've seen preachers that that didn't have much sense about doctrine, didn't have much sense about a lot of things, but boy, they loved the Lord and and, and what God gave them, boy, they they poured their heart out into people, had had healthy churches and loved their, their, their folks in their church and a sweet spirit. Remember, there was an old preacher over at Nick Guard's Corner for years, Paul Anderson. I don't know if anybody ever remembered Paul Anderson. Didn't have many teeth. Things teeth and missing. He was saying, I miss see all my friends on Hallelujah Square. And he'd cry and sing. And it'd touch your heart. I don't know how much doctrine he knew and a lot of other things. But what he did, he trusted in God. God put him through some steps. His daughter got killed car wreck I remember just all kinds of stuff but he's still there singing praises to God now uh, let's get back to our text here a few notes about this boy uh, he was a lad he could have uh, he could have kept those loaves and fishes uh, for himself he could have got lost in the crowd but rather this lad chose to come forward and be used of God man that uh, don't say how old he was, but when I was a lad, I didn't want anybody messing with my groceries. I didn't want anybody messing with my lunch. I've got a picture of, I don't know if I've seen the picture. I don't know if I have it. My cousin, Tim Chapman, he went to the zoo with, with his uh, uh, school class one time in Illinois. I think it was a Brookfield Zoo outside of Chicago. And it's a picture of him with all the other kids and his lunch bag was like a grocery bag. It was huge. And, and he told me the story. He said, Mommy said that, told me that there may be some kids there that didn't have any lunch. So she put enough for about 10 people. And he's carrying a big grocery bag full of lunch. So he could feed the other kids if he needed to. I can't see if I was that boy, it would have been tough for me to say, here, you can have my lunch. (laughs) And Jesus said in verse 10, make the men sit down, and and there was much grass in the place. I never have figured out, you know, what the, what the meaning, what the, there, the the grass had to do with it. They say every scripture that, you, you know, you pick it apart, there's something to do. You ever, any clues what that had to do with the story? But they sit down in the grass. There was much grass in the place. And I'm sure they weren't talking about pot back in those days. Uh, So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now the disciples having reason within themselves there was no way to feed this group. They're commanded to make them all sit down. And and now he tests not only their faith but now he's testing their obedience. What's he got up his sleeve? What's, What's going on here? We, are, we know that there's not enough to feed them, and now he wants us to make them all sit down. And I'm sure some things went through their mind, man, we're going to look like fools here in a few minutes. <laughs> Sometimes God will make you a fool for him. These uh, disciples reason within themselves, there's no way to feed this group, and, and they're told to make them sit down. Uh, They thought, man, he was wanting to make them sit down and obviously not anything to feed them with. Sometimes God commands us to do something and we just got to step out by faith and be obedient. 
and do it. Preachers know this. You'll come into the pulpit having a message you've worked on all week, and all of a sudden God puts it on your heart that there's, he wants something else preached. So you've got to change gears you, if you're going to mind the Lord. You'll be put in places where you need to either mind the Lord or not mind the Lord. Here's what's going on with the disciples. God commands us to do something, we're to obey him, not reason within ourselves and try to figure out whether we ought to or whether we, should, we ought to or not do it. I mean, why shouldn't Adam and Eve, why shouldn't they partake of that tree in the garden? I mean, it looks good, smells good. And heard that it may make you wise. Hmm. Because God commanded them not to. That's why. Why should Noah build an ark? Why, what's that all about? No sign of any rain, man. It, it, it's a big dry spell. Why in the world should Noah go out there and start building an ark so everybody could make fun of him? Hey, preacher, what are you doing down there? Why are you building down there, preacher? He just kept nailing those nails. And he looked like a fool. Because hmm. God commanded him to. Why do we get baptized? It's called believer's baptism. I don't need to get baptized. I got saved. Well, that's true, but all the disciples got baptized. We do it because it, it's being obedient to our, 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 our Lord. We're identifying ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We're, we're showing forth in like figure what Christ did in our hearts when we got saved. But we'll get a stub head. Some folks get stubborn about it. Oh, I don't need to do that. Hmm. There's a lot of things that God says, and, and we think, well, man, that's just out, out of date. Why, why, the, why should we believe that God preserved his word without error and without? Preserved his word perfect. Why do we believe that? Because God said that he would. He promised in Psalms 12, 6, and 7, he'd preserve his word to every generation. And then history's shown that that text that we use is one more souls to the Lord than all the other versions put together. So it's a pretty good hint of where it's at. Just things like that. Simply because God commanded these things and spoke these things. So the disciple here, the disciples here take a step of faith and they trust in Jesus Christ. They, they simply obey him. And sometimes when we can't reason within ourselves God's purpose and a lot of the things that we, we, we do, we still know what God wants us to do despite the circumstances, despite the lack of our understanding what God is doing in the thing. Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's where faith comes up. We step out by faith. Reservation, they took a leap of faith. Closing on their busiest day of the week, if Sunday. More money comes through that place on Sunday than any other day of the week. Hmm. They took a step of faith that God would bless them because God set an example before the law. And God worked six days and on the seventh day he rested. Under the law he said, Thou shalt work six days and rest on the seventh day. Told the farmers, you farm the land, farm the ground six years. On the seventh year, you let it rest. It's a good, it, God set the example. Sunday's church day. It's time for, to give God glory for some things. Get along with God and spend some time with your family. And you take stock and you thank the Lord for all his blessings. We're expected to step out in faith and obedience to Christ just as our Lord was obedient in all that he did. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
because he did everything the Father asked him to do. Not my will, but thine be done. Philippians 2, 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It says here in our text, it says, now there was much grass in this place. Mark added that the grass was green. Psalm 23, 2, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Verse 11 here, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise the fishes as much as they would. And uh, the Jesus didn't uh, comment. He didn't, he didn't comment about how little that it was. He didn't comment about the few loaves and the fishes he had. Hey, hey he used the, the, the tear of a baby to move the heart of Pharaoh's daughter. You remember that with Moses? He was a shepherd, a rod of Moses to work mighty miracles in, in Egypt before Pharaoh. He, he used David's sling and stone to overthrow the, the giant uh, Goliath. Man, God's always using the small things. He used a little maid to bring the mighty Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, to the prophet Elisha. Elijah, he used a, a handful of meal to sustain his prophet. He used a little child to teach his disciples a lesson in humility. Here he used five loaves and two small fishes to feed the multitude. Hey, if you're willing to trust him, if you're willing to trust him, maybe God can just start chipping away at those giants in your life, those obstacles in your life today, those things that seem insurmountable, inconceivable that you're going to get through this thing that you're having to deal with. Maybe you can, you trust him until you get small enough where he can use you. Like he did those small things. Here the Lord took what he had and he used them. Uh, when healing those, those bitter waters of Merah, remember that? God used a tree in healing Hezekiah from his boil. He said, take a lump of figs. He said, he'll recover. Put a lump of a plaster of figs. Does it say a lump of figs or a plaster of figs? He'll be healed. Timothy was told to use a little wine for his stomach's sake and then often infirmities. And God, God uses people and he uses natural means to carry out his supernatural work. Here on earth, imagine the uh, uh, the amazement of of the disciples here after they had uh, distributed to over five thousand people that would uh, that would, those things that when they looked at it thought it'd just barely feed a few. It says, and when he had given thanks, here he teaches us to acknowledge him as the giver. He's the one that does the miracle. We, we step out by that grain of mustard seed faith, and he moves the mountain. My, my, my. We forget. Often we forget. First Thessalonians 5, 8, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Then he distributes to all of us that we may become laborers together with God and it's the duty of every child of God who has received the bread of light and we're to distribute it to others. It says he distributed it to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. A lot in this story. That's a good chapter in scripture. John chapter 6. Where's your faith at tonight? What what Giants are you facing? What, what obstacles in your life that you've tried to fix and it looks hopeless and to the natural man, you're right. A lot of times, you know, uh, uh, we're critical of somebody who say, man, it looks hopeless, hopeless, but naturally speaking, they're right. But that's when you've got to step out by faith and trust in the spiritual. God is able to do what we can't do. And the Bible says that he, he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Isn't that something? He wants, 
He wants you to depend on Him. He wants you to call upon Him. He, he don't want to say, well, I don't want to bother with this guy. He, I don't want to bother with her problem. He wants to hear from you because you're his people. He loves you. He gets glory by doing good things and miraculous things for you. I'm done tonight. Just kind of musing on over some verses of scripture in that chapter. Are you trusting him tonight? Are you giving it to him? Are you bringing forth your strong arguments? Are you reasoning with him? I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. That's our Lord, man. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. He says, I'll never, never leave you nor forsake you. He won't forsake you in your cause. He won't forsake you in your battle, in your struggle. He won't forsake you. Lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. As we sing, the altar is open tonight. There's a burden on your heart. Won't you come? Come every soul.